The two on the left are Jonah. Jonah and the whale. <clears throat> so the story of Jonah is an interesting one. I'll, I'll just go over it very briefly. <clears throat> There's a city, and the city is full of people who are sinful. What does that mean? Well, to sin is an archery term. It means to miss the mark. So these are people who aren't oriented properly. And so the city is in a chaotic state. And God tells Jonah that he's going to go to that city and tell them just exactly what's up with them. And Jonah thinks, no, I'm not going to do that. And why? Well, that doesn't require much explanation. It's like, how popular are you going to be if you go to a city full of chaotic people and tell them why they're stupid and wrong? It's, Jonah thinks, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't care if God's telling me to do it. So his conscience is telling him to do it, or his destiny is telling him to do it, or, or his orientation with higher morality is telling him to do it. You can read it any way you want. And so he thinks, no, I'm hopping on this boat, and I'm getting as far away from that city as I possibly can. And so... He does that, and then the storm comes up, because God thinks, no, you're not getting away. If I told you to do something, you're not getting away from it. A storm comes up. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's easy. Betray your destiny, and see how long it takes you to be drowning in a storm. It'll happen immediately, and, and of course it will, because... What, what's calling you to be your best is exactly the thing that's pushing you forward to manifest yourself most fully in the world. It's what you need. You run away from that, the boat's going to start to rock very, very quickly. Well, and you all know that. You, per, you know that perfectly well. It, it, it's, hell, all you have to do is not study for an exam that you know that's coming up to see everything start to, the storm waters start to rise and everything start to rock. It's pretty bloody obvious. So anyways, he's on this boat, and there's a storm. And all of the people on the boat who, who can't quite discriminate chaos from weather because they haven't differentiated the world to that degree think, oh, the boat wouldn't be about to be swamped if we hadn't, some of us hadn't done something stupid and wrong. And there's logic in that. You know, you might think, well, God has nothing personal against you because of the storm, so you're confusing levels of analysis, but you got to give these people some credit. It's like, maybe they did do something stupid. Maybe they didn't caulk the damn boat properly. Maybe the ropes aren't in as good a shape as they might be. Maybe they weren't paying attention to the weather when they went out on the ocean, you know? Or maybe they haven't made peace with their brother, and so their hearts are bent and twisted out of shape, so they don't make particularly good sailors. It's like the idea that you encounter a storm because you're stupid and wrong is a really good idea, even though it's not of infinite applicability. Anyways, they draw lots. It's a primitive thing to do. It's like, well, it's, one, it's someone's fault. We don't know who. We're going to throw someone overboard, the worst sinner. Obviously, that's what God wants, some kind of sacrifice. So they all draw lots, and someone loses. And then Jonah stands up and says, well, sorry, guys. Like, I know that I've got a problem with God at the moment, so it's probably me. You better throw me over. And they don't really want to, but he finally convinces them. Over he goes, and the storm settles. Well, you know, sometimes if you're in a group of people in an organization, there is someone in the organization whose head isn't screwed on exactly straight. And they know exactly why it is, and what they've done wrong, and what puts them in that position. And they are poisoning the entire enterprise. And if you throw them overboard, or better, if they agree voluntarily to leave, then the storm will abate and everything will be okay. So anyways, they throw jo Job over, or Jonah overboard, and a whale comes up and swallows him, and takes him down to the bottom of the ocean. Well, we already know what that means, because we watched Pinocchio. It's like, when God abandons you, because you've abandoned your destiny, and the storms come up, the probability that you're going to be taken down to the, to the depths is extraordinarily high. And that happens in people's lives all the time. Well, so down there, Jonah repents. Well, what do you do when you're in the underworld? Well, you've been there before when things fall apart on you. Your friends have abandoned you. You're not as popular as you could be. You can't stand to look at yourself in the mirror. Into the underworld you go, and you think, geez, I've done a lot of things wrong. You know, maybe I should reconcile myself with the world and I could get out of this. Well, so that's what Jonah does. He thinks, all right, I've got this destiny. I better go do what God says. So the whale spits him out onto the beach and off he goes to the city to tell them what's wrong. Well, that's what that represents. That's these symbols, you know. It's so cool. This second one, I really, I really like. It's so interesting because you see Jonah re-emerging from the whale and he's got a halo around his head. You say, well, what's a halo? 
Well, have you ever looked at a quarter? Well, think about a quarter. A quarter is the moon. And who's on the quarter? The queen. The queen is surrounded by the halo of the moon. The queen's queen of the, queen of the night. Gold coin, that's the king's head on the sun. That's the halo. Well, what comes out of the belly of the, of the fish? It's the illuminated human being. It's the spirit of the illuminated human being. Well, that's what that means. Well, how, what does that mean? Well, what else would come out of chaos? You know, if you, if you fall apart and then you put yourself back together, what is it that comes back out? Well, at least you're in better shape than you were before, you know, and, and then maybe you do that 20 times in your life, or 50 times, and you do it voluntarily. Every time you do it, you're more like the thing with the halo, and less like the thing that's, you know, being thrown overboard by your friends. And then you see this representation on the right. This is a very complicated representation. So in this one, you see Christ who's carrying his cross with the sun behind him. That's the halo that I was talking about. He's the person who's voluntarily accepted the necessity of death and renewal. That's what the cross represents. And so it's a, it's an, it's a what would you call it? An abstracted representation of this, a further developed idea of this. And then you see in the back, this is a feminine symbol. Right? It's, a, it's a symbol of birth, and, and you'll, you'll understand more when I, when I show you the symbols later. This is the eternal opening in the world from which new forms emerge. It's the place from which babies emerge, and you can tell that if you look carefully because you see all these little heads there with wings on them. Those are all spirits waiting to be born. And so the hero emerges from the, from the eternal feminine, willing to die and suffer, and in doing so, just defeating the snake, the snakes down there, and the adversary at the same time. Well, it's no wonder we don't understand those images. I mean, they're so unbelievably rich that how could you possibly articulate them? That's why they emerged in imagistic form to begin with. The artists get there before the philosophers, long before the philosophers. The dramatists get there way before the artists even. And so we, we figured it out, we represented it in art and literature and music and drama, and then we're on the cusp, so to speak, of understanding it in a fully articulated manner. And not a moment too soon.